Welcome, everyone. My name is Brad Crabtree. Uh, I staff the Carbon Management Program at the Great Plains Institute, and GPI is playing a role in staffing the modeling work that we'll be discussing uh, in this uh, in this presentation. I want to thank everyone for for coming and for the terrific turnout. We had well over a hundred registrants. Uh, it's very exciting to see this level of interest in this topic. Before I jump into that, uh, since there are folks still joining, um, why don't we have Lauren just walk through the WebEx interface, which is uh, mo most of you have done WebEx at this point, but it's a little different than Zoom. Sure. Yeah. So I just wanted to lay out a few guidelines today. Um, we're going to actually have everyone stay on mute for the entirety of the webinar, and we're going to use the chat feature. Um, which you can see at the bottom of your uh, like screen toolbar. Um, it looks like a little chat icon, just click that. Um, and you are able to direct any questions you have and I will see them. Um, and we will field them when we have our Q&A session. Um, so yes, please stay on mute. You should all be on mute um, as you enter the meeting. Uh, it will just make for a, uh, an easier flow to the meeting and to make sure we reduce any, you know, sound feedback and things like that. And yeah, thanks for joining. Please chat. Um, feel free to chat any questions you have regarding technology as well, and I can help you troubleshoot that. Great. Thank you, Lauren. Um, we now have over 70 people signed in, so we'll get started and we'll still have more people joining. But, but let me begin again by thanking everyone for joining us. Um, many people on this call have been involved for a number of years in working to advance policies to incentivize the deployment of carbon capture technology. And I think the, the success of the passage reform and expansion of the Section 45Q tax credit at the federal level in February of 2018 was a major success story in that regard. In the past few years, there's uh, been a growing effort now to pay it, draw attention to policy and initiatives to advance the deployment of CO2 transport infrastructure. And that's to get beyond what is a classic chicken and egg challenge that we see with all infrastructure issues, which in this case is um, you, you will not have interest in the ability to deploy CO2 transport infrastructure if you don't have the carbon capture projects to supply the CO2. Conversely, um, there won't be an interest in developing these carbon capture projects if the developer of those projects aren't assured that they will have the ability to transport that CO2 to where it can be safely and permanently stored or put to beneficial use. So with that, um, in the passage of 45Q in 2018, governors and state officials we were working with encouraged the state carbon capture work group that we staff at GPI, a group of 16 states plus stakeholders, to focus on regional deployment and to make sure that in response to the 45Q tax credit, we're putting steel in the ground. So early that year, we initiated the development of a modeling process, uh, a two year long effort, over two year effort that involves uh, federal labs, state agents, research institutions, private consulting firms, a really excellent national modeling team that you'll be hearing from today to model on a regional scale, the capture, transport, and geologic storage of CO2. What's really exciting about the modeling results you'll see today is that they make tangible both the economic opportunity of economy-wide carbon capture deployment, but also the climate benefits. What you'll see are scenarios showing anywhere from one-third to two-thirds of a gigaton uh, in other words, a billion tons of, of carbon management across 25 states. Uh, this is very exciting. What it shows is that if you were to take this modeling to a national scale, you could easily get to a billion tons. The United States emits a billion tons of CO2 a year, and the IEA has suggested in their modeling that carbon capture needs to deliver 20% of total reduct CO2 reductions in 2050 from carbon capture. So this modeling shows that we literally have the potential to be on track to, to meet carbon capture's contribution to mid-century climate goals. Um, the, the, at this point, um, the modeling has been completed and released in a paper that uh, our colleagues will be telling you about later in this presentation. It's being used by the state carbon capture work group I mentioned, but also what 
what we're calling the regional carbon capture deployment initiatives in the broader Midwest and Western state regions. At this point, they're bringing together nearly 400 state officials and stakeholders to map out how we can deploy carbon capture at scale and the CO2 infrastructure to transport that CO2. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, our next two speakers and I'll introduce them before they get started. The first is Sean Yaw. Sean is an assistant professor at the Gianforte Forte School of Computing at Montana State University. He's been a core member of our modeling team. Uh, he specializes in a whole range of aspects of cloud computing, smart grid, geologic storage, <clears throat> and LIDAR system management. And before I turn to Sean, I'll just go ahead and also introduce Kevin Ellett, who will follow him. Kevin is a research geologist at Indiana State University. He focuses on geologic and hydrological modeling, uh, reservoir characterization and simulation, and carbon sequestration and utilization. I'd also note that, that Kevin has played a lead role in, in working with experts around the country to put together the Scott modeling tool, which is a new modeling tool <clears throat> focused on saline geologic storage. So we're really lucky to have uh, these two gentlemen as part of the, part research, of the research team, team. and his colleagues in this effort. So with that, I will turn it over to Sean. Thank you, Brad. Yes, yeah, so my name is Sean Yaw. As Brad said, I'm a, a professor at Montana State University in the Computer Science Department. Um, I'm happy to have the opportunity today to talk ever so briefly about SimCCS, which is the uh, one of the modeling tools that was used in the study being presented today. So SimCCS is a open source software that uh, determines the most cost effective way to deploy carbon capture infrastructure. Uh, it's a brainchild of Richard Middleton, who's a scientist out of Los Alamos National Lab. And over the past several years, we've developed it at Los Alamos, Montana State and Indiana University. Um, this development culminated uh, in 2019 with uh, SimCCS winning two awards at the R&D 100 award ceremony. So SimCCS is really the story of two uh, complementary efforts. Uh, the first is theoretical development of a model that can determine uh, how to design a CCS network. And the second is practical application of that tool. So under the hood, SimCCS is composed of a custom network optimization model. Um, it concurrently optimizes uh, capture locations, storage locations, and pipeline networks in such a way that you have the most cost-effective infrastructure that achieves some predetermined objective, such as uh, capture a certain amount of CO2 per year. Um, the data in ingests is uh, data concerning these uh, sources and sinks, such as locations, capacities and costs, uh, economic models that, that quantify the cost effectiveness of certain locations. Um, we generate pipeline networks via a uh, geospatial routing process that we have that determines where likely pipeline networks could exist. This is all fed into the SimCCS model which then uh, solves and comes up with the cheapest infrastructure that achieves um, the, the target that's being optimized at that moment. And so that's really the one side, the theoretical development. And uh, a lot of what we've, what's gone into SimCCS is this development of novel algorithms and network design and uh, solving these fundamental mathematical problems but uh, having a really flashy tool without applying it to realistic real world data isn't uh, isn't useful outside of an academic setting. So our collaboration with uh, the Great Plains Institute and the Regional Carbon Capture Deployment Initiative really allowed us to take the uh, research training wheels off SimCCS and see how it handled in the real world. And so that's that's kind of what uh, our contribution to this uh, this talk has been is seeing how CCS can actually ingest real data, come up with reasonable uh, deployment scenarios for uh, CCS adoption. Um, we've worked with industrial partners before we, we did this effort with GPI, but nothing on the degree, nothing to the degree that we have in terms of just sheer geographic extent 
as well as uh, the number of sources and sinks uh, required to to kind of come up with good uh, deployment scenarios. Um, and so what this really enabled us, forced us to do is to innovate. Um, and so this collaboration with GPI uh, has forced us to come up with an even better model that can handle scalability to thousands of sources and sinks. Um, and it's really been a mutually beneficial collaboration. Um, so to conclude, uh, the team SIM CCS very happily supported GPI's efforts in this study. And uh, we look forward to hopefully advancing CCS adoption in the future. Okay, thanks, Brad and, and Sean. Um, as Brad mentioned, I'm a research scientist at Indiana University. And uh, let's go ahead to the next slide. I've got three slides to present today. Start with just filling in a little bit of background on the Indiana University team and um, some of our history that led up to our support of this great work that GPI is presenting today. Um, here at IU, we house the Indiana Geological and Water Survey, uh, where I've been for the last decade. And I also lead another team at the Pervasive Technology Institute, uh, which I'll talk about um, some of the work we've been doing there that also supports SIMCCS uh, more recently. But basically, since uh, about 2003, so about a couple of decades now, the Indiana Geological and Water Survey has been involved with uh, a lot of work on CCUS, primarily reservoir characterization and assessment to get to uh, what we call storage resource estimates or where the resource is to store CO2 in the subsurface with a particular focus on saline formations. Uh, we did that work under the partnerships MGSC and MRCSP. So we were in two of the seven regional partnerships. Uh, MGSC is led by our colleagues at Illinois State Geological Survey and the MRCSP, which extends the Midwest further out to the East Coast, uh, led by Naraj Gupta Patel. Um, and as part of that, the, the sort of flagship products that came out of that work through multiple phases were contributions to DOE's NACCARB or National Carbon Database and also the Atlas product. So you see here in the upper right, um, this is the last version of the Atlas that uh, DOE put out. This is Atlas 5. And you can see all the different saline formations, the dark blue that were assessed. So pretty much through the regional partnerships and, and our piece was that big blue piece there in the, in the Eastern part that we worked with all kinds of state surveys across that region and other partners to assess um literally hundreds of formations uh, across all of these basins that you see there so a pretty fantastic product that came out from all the doe r d support over the years um, but that being said it had some limitations and that's what we'll get to in terms of scott uh, in addition to that work we also worked on some of the ara projects uh, the u.s china clean energy research center led by west virginia university and that one was actually a key for us because that's where we began partnering with Los Alamos and uh, Richard Middleton and I for the last oh, eight or nine years now um, got to do a lot of the, the background work that ultimately fed into the support we gave GPI here for their study uh, today. Uh, we also work on several carbon safes and uh, kudos to Steve Whitaker and the Illinois survey team again, as we're just gonna start up a phase three carbon safe uh, here in the Illinois Basin. And obviously now we've kind of moved into a new phase of regional partnerships. And in the case of IU, we work at the MRCI and the CUSP regional initiatives. Um, some people have talked about this as being phase four of the regional partnerships, but really I would say it's different because um, not as much focus on the geologic characterization. We've already advanced that work through the prior work um, and really more of a focus on regional deployment. And this is where GPI's work over the last couple of years with their leadership, uh, I think is instrumental to the success of the new regional initiatives going forward, because it's really about building these broader stakeholder groups and all the other pieces that we need to put together to advance uh, deployment in a very large scale way. Uh, I mentioned that I'm also at the Pervasive Technology Institute and for the last three years, We've been developing something called the SIMCCS Gateway software, 
Um, so this is where we took Richard and Sean's SimCCS code and put that into a new online cloud computing framework. And this has really been a game changer in terms of stakeholder engagement. You can see the image in the bottom right is one of the SimCCS workshops that we hosted. Uh, and here we're showing the gateway where we can bring all this kind of information you'll see online and people can actually change scenarios and stuff in real time, send that off to our supercomputers at IU, uh, typically get the results back in minutes and, and keep working on these problems in a, in a really unprecedented fashion. Um, and the final piece, the last couple of years, we've focused again with, with Richard Middleton on this Scott development. Um, Scott is another tool that Richard developed at Los Alamos and then here at IU, we've been advancing that and particularly our, our contribution with Scott and also to the GPI work is the nationwide application of Scott. Uh, next slide, please. So Scott stands for the sequestration of CO2 tool. Uh, this is another open source tool like the SimCCS code, uh, but in this case, it's built into an Excel um, spreadsheet framework. So you can see in the upper right, a screenshot of what the Scott tool looks like. It's very user-friendly. Um, everybody has Excel basically. And so it's a way for um, folks to begin to move beyond what we did before in terms of storage resources and really get to the, the more important information we need, which is the more detailed, what we call storage capacity of these saline reservoirs, and in particular, the cost. So it works by using reduced order models that were trained on the actual multi-phase physics. So the underlying processes of uh, injectivity, what do the plumes look like in the subsurface, all that kind of stuff is modeled with very detailed physics models and then these reduced order models to be able to effectively use that carb level information. So the things you'll find in that carb are for these saline formations are, you know, depth, thickness, porosity, permeability. And we can use that simple parameter type of information to come up with a detailed assessment of what the actual storage capacity would be for CO2 in these saline formations. And most importantly, what the cost would be. So the number of wells you'd have to drill, that kind of information feeds back into what the cost would actually be. Um, we use this in terms of analysis for reservoir screening, and you can do sensitivity analysis, uncertainty analysis. But what we fed to GPI in this effort is really the reservoir screening. So in the bottom right, you can see our map using Scott of not storage resource, but rather storage capacity. So this is now a heat map showing you when you look at all of these different formations on a 10 kilometer uh, grid cell across all the, the nation, where are the really good storage opportunities? Um, and so that, that's essentially that heat map. Uh, the green stuff is good, greater than 50 million tons of CO2 we estimate could be stored in that 10 kilometer by 10 kilometer region. Um, oftentimes that's actually multiple different saline targets within that 10 kilometer grid cell. And then as you move down to the red, you know, less than, than uh, 10 megatons could be stored in there by our estimates. Uh, final slide. So this shows you, um, in addition to the storage capacity, um, what we were able to do with this work was present the first national map of what CO2 storage costs would be for saline formation storage. And as Brad mentioned with 45Q, um, saline storage suddenly became a real uh, potential game changer for advancing CCUS deployment at a large scale. And the, the kind of information GPI needed to move forward is what you see here on the left. Um, now we've got all of the different reservoirs uh, on that 10 kilometer grid cell characterized by the total cost of storage in dollars per ton of CO2. So in this case, the, the green areas are where we estimate you could store CO2 there for less than $5 per ton, um, going all the way up to the red areas, red areas where we, we estimate that's greater than $25 per ton of CO2. Um, and then on the right-hand side, this is uh, two 3D images of the same kind of data, but it actually combines both the storage capacity and the cost. So the colors you, you see here 
on the top right, that's for the Western US region. Uh, you can see the, the costs and the colors, and then also the height of those bars um, demonstrates what the capacity would be for each one of those. Uh, the bottom right is showing you the Southeast US region in detail, and you can zoom up into the, the uh, Northeast region there, you can see Illinois, Michigan, and Appalachian basins. Um, so that's all I have for today, and I'll turn it over to Dane to get onto the uh, broader modeling work. All right, uh, thank you, Kevin, and, and thank you, Sean, for that kind of overview of some of the, the collaborative approach and data and different partners we, we used on this analysis. So uh, this is Dane McFarland, Director of Research at the Great Plains Institute. Uh, like Brad introduced earlier, uh, GPI facilitates the Regional Carbon Capture Deployment Initiative and through this initiative for the past two years, we've been uh, working with all of our participants across the US uh, to, to do an analysis. And next slide, please, Lauren. So uh, just a few weeks ago, we published our analytical white paper on transport infrastructure for carbon, and carbon capture and storage. You can find that paper at carboncaptureready.org slash analysis. And if we share the slides out later, you'll be able to click that link and download the paper. Next slide. So the, the goal of this analysis was to, to look nationwide and identify near-term opportunities for CO2 capture retrofit on existing industrial and power facilities. Um, we, we wanted to locate areas of CO2 storage and use and the, the work that Kevin showed from all of the geological surveys and research across the US really helped inform that. And then finally, to, to take those sources and the storage locations and put them together and model optimized CO2 transport infrastructure in order to maximize capture and storage while minimizing cost and land use. Um, some of our primary partners through this regional deployment initiative work, uh, Los Alamos, National Laboratory, Indiana University, Montana State University, uh, Jeff Brown, formerly of Stanford University, now at the University of Wyoming Enhanced Oil Recovery Institute, uh, performed some of our primary uh, facility screening and, and cost estimation for our capture sources. And you can see on the map on the right, this was our initial scoping of broad CO2 transport corridors in the United States, looking at gen generally where our power plants in blue, industrial facilities in gray, and yellow are biofuel refineries. Where are there opportunities to capture and where are the op uh, current areas of utilization and opportunities for storage? And what are some broad general corridors that, that would transport between the two? And our work really built on that and became much more specific. So to talk more specifically about the results of our work, I'm gonna hand it over to Elizabeth Abramson, who's a research analyst at GPI who did quite a bit of work on this research. All right, thanks, Dane. Um, Lauren, we can go on to the next slide there. So with our partners at Stanford University, we conducted a review of major emitting facilities and screened them for expected 45Q eligibility and potential to support a retrofit with carbon capture equipment in the near or medium term. So those dark teal dots you see there on the map are facilities that we've identified as being likely 45Q eligible. So for industrial facilities, that means that they emit over 100,000 tons of CO2 per year. And for power facilities, that means they emit over 500,000 tons of CO2 per year. So you can see that those dark teal dots are pretty prevalent across the nation. If you look at those bright purple dots, those represent the facilities within our study region that we identified as especially likely near or medium term candidates for capture retrofit. So to identify those facilities, we looked at 45Q eligibility. We looked at whether the facility had frequent and consistent patterns of operation. We looked to see if the facility was slated to close anytime soon. Um, and we analyzed facilities at the unit level in order to be able to um, identify capturable streams of CO2 within each facility, and then to right size capture equipment to those specific levels. And finally, looking back at the map, if you see those light gray dots there, those are facilities that are remaining that were not 45Q eligible and that also weren't identified as likely near or medium term candidates. You can go on to the next slide. 
So there are vast opportunities to store at minimum hundreds of years worth of US facility emissions in geologic formations throughout the country, uh, particularly down towards the Gulf Coast region, the Permian Basin, up through the Rockies, and then over towards uh, Illinois and Ohio. If you look at those gray-blue polygons there, those represent geologic saline formations. And if you see those purple triangles, those represent existing petroleum basins with technical potential for carbon storage. Um, we relied on the Scott geologic model, which Kevin just discussed, um, to gather more detailed information on geologic saline formations and to isolate those saline layers with the lowest injection costs to incorporate into our analysis. Next slide. Thanks. So our analysis identified facilities from a wide variety of industries as likely candidates for near or medium term capture retrofit. This graph and table show that many facilities in mid-tier industries have reasonable capture costs when applying that unit level facility screening and right sizing of capture equipment. Generally, we see that the high purity and concentration of CO2 emissions in industries like gas processing, ethanol, and ammonia result in the lowest estimated capture costs on a per ton basis. Next slide. Thanks. So after completing our facility screening process and gathering data on carbon storage sites, we conducted a series of scenario modeling efforts to identify an optimized CO2 transport infrastructure network to connect those sources to sinks using the Los Alamos SimCCS model. As explained by Sean, the SimCCS model maximizes the amount of carbon captured and stored while minimizing infrastructure investment and land use impact. Part of how the model does that is by avoiding over a dozen specific land use types, such as bodies of water, areas with high population density, uh, protected federal lands, and tribal and sovereign territories. So avoiding those areas will minimize any extra land and environmental impact. Using the SimCCS model, we conducted three primary scenario variations. With the baseline scenario you see here on this map, showing a vision of regional infrastructure that could become feasible with some additional policy and financing support in the near to medium term. Each colored dot there you see on the map represents a near or medium term candidate for capture that we identified in our facility screening process. And here you can see them each colored by industry. Those black triangles you see on the map represent existing petroleum basins with potential CO2 demand. And the blue triangles you see there represent non-specific potential saline injection areas. Running between those sinks and sources, you can see the optimized infrastructure network that the SimCCS model produced. Our modeling identified multiple high capacity trunk segments aggregating CO2 from sources throughout the study region for transport down to Texas and the Permian Basin, uh, with smaller feeder lines connecting individual sources to those major trunk lines. On this map, you can see the capacity of each uh, segment varying with the width of the line depicting it. So this scenario you see here would result in the capture and permanent storage of nearly 300 million metric tons of CO2 per year. Next slide. So we also conducted a sensitivity analysis with highly conservative financial assumptions. This identifies specific segments of the transport network that would easily break even in today's policy and economic landscape with 45Q tax credits and revenue from the sale of CO2. And even under these strict economic conditions, we've found a plethora of opportunities for near, uh, near term capture retrofit, especially in the Midwest from high purity, low cost industrial sources, such as um, in the biofuels industry, you can see there those orange dots. Uh, represent biofuels facilities. And this sensitivity analysis showed that there is financial opportunity today to start building a shared regional CO2 corridor that will serve greater deployment and transport into the future. Next slide. The transport networks that our modeling produced include a combination of smaller feeder lines connecting to individual capture sites and high capacity trunk lines that aggregate CO2 from those smaller feeder lines for further transport. Using the National Energy Technology Lab's CO2 transport cost model, our analysis found that large trunk lines 
which you can see here on the map shaded in green, achieve the best economies of scale and lowest per ton transport costs. All those smaller feeder lines you can see uh, in the orange color, um, they require less capital investment but have a higher per ton transport cost. Next slide. So using that NETL CO2 transport cost model to calculate investment requirements, we found clear economies of scale with those higher capacity uh, shared infrastructure segments. Many of the costs involved in construction are not actually related to materials, but rather related to land use right of way, engineering and labor costs. So these non-material costs and the land for construction don't necessarily grow with higher capacity transport segments. Total costs of infrastructure actually decline on a per inch mile basis with increased capacity, as we can see on the graph in, on the left. And because the resulting transport tariff that users of the network must pay is based on those infrastructure costs, transport tariffs also decline on a per ton basis with higher capacity shared infrastructure. So again, on that graph on the right, we're seeing another uh, declining trend line as, as we go up in pipeline diameter. Next slide. Thanks. So zooming into a sample of the infrastructure network from one of our modeling scenarios, we see a mix of CO2 delivery capacities depicting with the varying thickness of each line, and we see the associated transport tariff uh, labeled on each segment there. Smaller feeder lines like the one circled in the upper right have a higher effective transport tariff, while those midsize and major trunk segments that are also circled have transport tariffs that are well under $10. A typical user of the pipeline network would have to pay some combination or average of the tariffs along the route between a capture facility and its ultimate storage destination. So because most users will deliver CO2 through a combination of those smaller feeder lines and those larger trunk lines, every user will benefit from the lower effective cost per ton along those larger common carrier segments. Next slide. Finally, we conducted a scenario showing expanded capture and storage in a network aligning with mid-century decarbonization goals. This network includes all 45Q eligible sources um, and expanded storage in geologic saline formations and petroleum basins. This network then results in roughly 670 million metric tons of CO2 captured and permanently stored per year. Again, we see several high capacity trunk lines aggregating CO2 from sources throughout the region down for transport towards Texas and the Gulf. We also see an increase of short transport segments leading from facilities to nearby saline formations for injection. Next slide. So the final results of our study compare the quantity of CO2 stored to the capital investment and land use requirements of each scenario. The near and medium term scenario delivered 281 million metric tons of CO2 for storage annually, while that mid-century decarbonization scenario delivered more than twice that amount with 669 million metric tons of CO2 stored annually. The, average, uh, the infrastructure modeling and estimated investment requirements calculated in our research found that planning on that longer time horizon achieved uh, a doubling of carbon storage with barely any land use impact. Um, and we can see that um, on the bottom row of the table. Planning for mid-century levels of deployment increased the amount of carbon stored by 138%, while having only a marginal 0.7% impact on land use. Additionally, that doubling of carbon storage was also associated with a pretty minor 16% increase in capital investment, 7% increase in project labor investment, and 0.8% increase in annual O&M spending operating and maintenance spending. So developing policy solutions and region-wide coordination in the near term to support mid-century levels of carbon capture deployment will allow us to take advantage of those environmental benefits and economies of scale, which we likely wouldn't capture by planning out a network with only near-term projects in mind. Next slide. So how is the mid-century network able to capture and store more than twice the amount of CO2 than the near and medium, medium term network with such minimal additional investment? This graph compares the infrastructure network in each of those two scenarios. The blue bars show the distribution of transport segment sizes for the near and medium term scenario, and the orange bars show the distribution of transport segment sizes built out in that mid-century scenario. 
The mid-century scenario built out a greater proportion of high-capacity 24 and 30-inch diameter trunk lines than the near and medium-term scenario did. These high-capacity segments enable greater quantities of CO2 delivery without increasing the physical footprint of the network, and they allow users to take advantage of low transport tari tariffs along those high-capacity lines. And additionally, the mid-century scenario expanded the delivery of CO2 to local saline formations, which require much shorter transport distances um, and a smaller capital investment. Next slide. You can find all of these results, um, maps, and a detailed description of our methodology and findings in our white paper, which as Dane mentioned, you can find at our website, carboncaptureready.org. Next, I'd like to hand things off to my colleague, Whitney Herndon at the Rhodium Group to talk about a forthcoming analysis on the economic impact and jobs that will build on the results of this study we've just discussed. Whitney is an associate director at Rhodium Group and manages the firm's US energy research. She manages a team of analysts that use a range of energy and economic models to analyze the impact of policy proposals and market shifts on the US energy system and macroeconomy. Her expertise includes carbon capture, energy, and electric power systems modeling, and economy-wide decarbonization. I'll hand things off now to Whitney. Thank you. Thanks, Elizabeth. Um, okay, so I'm just going to cover today um, a, a additional piece of research that we've been taking on this year um, and what's in scope for us and what we're doing related to carbon capture and the other work you guys have seen presented on today. Um, so what we are doing at Rhodium Group, um, we have been, um, in light of um, the, the recent <laughs> economy, basically, and other interest in carbon capture projects, we've been actually entering the field of jobs analysis, um, and uh, we released a report last month on uh, looking at the jobs impact of direct air capture and now we are working to kind of deploy those skills in carbon capture so we're taking on a three-phase analysis um, looking at the near and medium term um, scenarios that elizabeth and dane described um, from their modeling and taking the subset of regional carbon capture um, deployment initiative states in analyzing what the economic and employment um, impact is from building those carbon capture plants. Um, and we're doing that um, on a state-by-state -state basis and also a industry-by-industry -industry basis. Um, so that's the first phase of our analysis that will be uh, ready later this summer. And then after that, we are doing um, a similar subsequent analysis where we are going to actually look at the carbon capture opportunity and also economic and employment impacts for the remaining states that are outside the regional um, carbon capture deployment initiative. So that's mostly mostly coastal states, um, some other western and eastern states. Um, and so that will be our um, second phase of analysis that will be released. And then we are going to, um, at, at the end of the year, be releasing a more long-term national focused analysis that is focused on the amount of carbon capture needed for mid-century decarbonization. Um, much similar to the scenario that Elizabeth showed where um, they had built out the mid-century um, amount of pipelines needed for the carbon capture network, except for this will also encompass all of the states in the continental US. Um, and for all three pieces of analyses, we're going to be looking at the direct employment impacts for the plants themselves, and also the pipeline networks associated um, with needing to for scaling up the deployment. Um, so I think yeah, we've, we, we've released some preliminary plant by plant um, results and uh, the Carbon Capture Coalition has sent those around. I don't have a slide of them today and we'll be revising and updating and providing all the um, state by state uh, results soon. But um, look out for that later. The starting results will be starting to come out, I think, later this summer. Um, and we're really excited to be taking on this piece of work. 
Thank you. Thank you, Whitney. I think uh, Patrice Lalam is up next. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Patrice Lalam. I'm a program consultant to the Great Plains Institute, and I also work uh, with Brad Dane, Whitney, Elizabeth, and others on the Regional uh, Deployment Initiative and other carbon management uh, programs. Next slide, please, Lauren. Uh, so, you know, the title of this slide, Carbon Capture States um, and Regional Efforts to, to Gain Traction, we've certainly seen a lot of growing interest and, and opportunity um, over, over the course of the last several years. And as you can see on this timeline, um, our work at GPI from a state and regional perspective really began in, in 2015 when we worked with then Governor Mead in Wyoming and Governor Bullock in Montana to form and launch the state carbon capture work group. And, you know, at that point in time, the states and um, some experts that they brought in to help help with the discussion, uh, we spent a lot of time doing some joint learning together and developed policy recommendations uh, that we finally referred to as the puzzle paper that was published back in, in late 2016. And that led to additional research in 2017 um, on electricity market design, carbon capture and ethanol opportunities. And then uh, what's culminated uh, into this report and, and the last couple of years of work here, um, CO2 transport infrastructure. Um, and, and so, you know, that initial group really um, was, was uh, the precursor to, to the regional deployment initiative. Um, the work group really decided in, in 20, end of 2017, early 2018, that we really needed to bring in additional stakeholders to the conversation and to really begin to shift our focus towards planning for the future, identifying near-term opportunities across the region, and certainly providing um, educational opportunities. And with that, the Regional Carbon Capture Deployment Initiative was born in the Midwest and West. And as Dane and Brad and others have described, uh, you know, the, the paper that has been released by GPI is the culmination of all of the analysis and uh, input from stakeholders over time. Um, our network of stakeholders and states interested and involved um, in these efforts has grown to nearly 400 people since the beginning um, of the project, which is really heartening to see. And so, you know, we are going to be focusing on obviously spreading the word about this fantastic work that, uh, that Dane Elizabeth and others have done um, on this analysis. And we're also working with states really to broaden um, broaden the focus to look at what kind of policies on the state level can help close the cost gap where necessary to build on what's in place with 45Q on the federal level. And so to that end, uh, and as Dane referenced uh, with the link in his presentation, uh, the Carbon Capture Ready website is something that, that GPI launched in late 2019 to not only serve as a place to showcase the analysis uh, that, that our team has conducted, but also to provide states, policymakers, stakeholders, uh, various tools and educational materials that are in some cases state specific, um, in other cases broader to uh, help move the needle, to help educate uh, folks about the opportunities relative to, to carbon capture. Um, on that website, you'll, you'll find fact sheets and, and uh, 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 best practices documents that, that let states know um, the things that they should be thinking about in order to become carbon capture ready. We're also, you know, working across the 25 states in the Midwest and West uh, regions to help prepare for 2021 legislative sessions. And we're also in conversations with states about what regional cooperation might look like uh, relative to CO2 transport infrastructure and potential hub development. Next slide, please. And so I encourage everyone to uh, take a look at carboncaptureready.org. You know, again, the analysis tab showcases Dane and Elizabeth's uh, paper. Um, you can uh, go into various states and look at state fact sheets that are published and other uh, resources, information, and tools. Um, the final slide that I have, Lauren, you can go ahead one more, is just an example of what state fact sheets look like. 
Um, they, you know, provide some historical context, the current landscape, um, what near-term opportunities there may be, and, and also a, a look at uh, where the potential sources are um, in each state. Thanks, Jane. And that brings us to the top of the hour. Um, and I, I just want to thank our presenters today uh, for joining us and to everyone who was a partner in, tar in part and partook in the, the analysis uh, that has been described today. Special thanks to Dane and Elizabeth for all of their tremendous work. We will be in touch with everyone who registered for the webinar, both with the a recording uh, of the webinar, uh, links to the report and other relevant information. And also feel free to reach out to anyone on our team if there are questions that you have that we didn't get to. We certainly look, look forward to uh, all, all that that uh, the future holds with respect to carbon capture and, and the opportunities on a state, regional, and, and national level. So with that, thanks everyone and have a great day.